And I don't know if you've been like me. I've lost my way a time or two. Uh, just recently, uh, I was um, uh, using my phone for walking directions in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was... I was trying to find the hotel that Fonda was at, and Serenity and I had just gotten off the metro, and I had used the telephone app to find directions. And so I took a left following the, the phone, then I took another left, and then I took a right, and it, uh, this hotel was nowhere to be found. Literally, it was just a half a block away, but my... Uh, GPS application on my phone took me in a completely different direction. And have you ever been lost? Taken wrong directions, gotten wrong advice? Now what made this more anxious is I was in Washington DC with my little girl. And that can be scary uh, when you're lost uh, and someone's depending on you. And, uh, and it, was, it, it was very scary. And sometimes, what I love about this passage and what I love about God's Word is that we can connect to what these people are going through. Here's two men we're going to encounter in a minute, and they're lost. They know where they are in place, but in experience, they, they're completely lost. Their hopes have been dashed, and they don't know which way to turn or where to go. And I love this story because we find these two men that are walking down the wrong path are encountered by another man and they're met by Jesus Christ. And I pray that this morning that you will be met by the risen Lord Jesus Christ and some of the things that you and I are going through together. So let's pray and then let's, let's seek God's word. Father, I want to thank you that today we can experience your power, your presence through the living word of God. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you care enough to reveal yourself to us and to make yourself known. And I ask you, Father, to take care of us this morning and to speak to us. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart can be acceptable and that thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus, I lift this prayer. All God's people say, Amen. Um, I had a great week with Brian. Uh, I took, uh, Brian and I took a track to, um, uh, to, to Lynchburg every day. He finished up one of his master's level intensives. And um, in the near future, um, when the weather breaks, Brian is going to be our counselor for our church. He's tra as a trained counselor, and he was with about 50 or so other people there. And I'm, I'm just telling you, he shines like a light. Uh, and uh, you, we have a gift. If, if you're going through any uh, challenges or difficulties, uh, we're going to soon have Brian's number. And he's going to set up times to be with you. And you can come and have uh, someone work through some of the challenges that you are facing. And have some, you know, a, a, a resource like Brian. Uh, I'm telling you, he is incredible. And so I encourage you to start using that resource and uh, call Brian. And I'll, Brian, I'll start putting your number in the bulletin so people can get in touch with you. Uh, but, but so, and one of the things I'm facing, my brother Rick's in the back with my other brother Donna, and. Um, I've gotten to the t age where I have to use these glasses all the time or I can't read what's in front of me. Uh, and, and so forgive me for that, but I, I'm just so now I'm so dependent on these reading glasses. I have to wear them all the time. And do I look wise now? No. <laughs> I'm not growing old gracefully, I guess. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 13 of Luke chapter 24. Uh, the first thing we see is that Jesus meets us in the middle of our way. Jesus meets us in the middle of, of our way. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. Verse 14 goes on to say, they talked together 
of all these things that had happened. Now, these two of them were disciples. And they, just like Jesus had appeared to other people, uh, this same day is the same day that Jesus had risen from the dead. It was Sunday. It was what we call now the Lord's Day. And some exciting things had happened that day. Uh, Mary and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary had gone to the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And then the disciples came, uh, Peter uh, ran to the, the, the temple, and the, the body was gone. And there was a lot of speculation, a lot of confusion. Uh, they weren't sure what had happened at this point, even though uh, Mary Magdalene had seen an angel, and they said, the Lord is risen. These two men, Cleopas, were going the wrong direction. They were leaving, the Bible says, uh, Jerusalem and going to a little town called Emmaus. And the same day was the day of his resurrection. And so here all this exciting things are happening in Jerusalem. And what do we find our two guys? They're going away from Jerusalem. They're going in the wrong direction, just like I shared earlier to, uh, this morning. You know, the feeling of being lost and being confused and being frustrated and not knowing which way to go, where to turn. That's, that's where they were because they had hoped in Jesus. We'll find more about what they thought about Jesus. Um, and, but verse 14, it says, they talked of all these things that it happened. And verse 15, so it was, while they conversed and reasoned, now those words conversed and reasons mean they were, they were talking forcefully with one another. In fact, I would say that they were arguing with one another. Not only were they confused, they were starting to confront one another, but while they conversed and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, what we see here is that they had a sense of sadness and despair. They, they had, were de devastated that their hopes had been dashed. And they, were, uh, they had these rushing and entangling thoughts. And uh, quite frankly, they were confused. And their confusion led to confrontation. And their confrontation uh, led to conflict. Uh, now, it just, it just reminded me of how easily that can happen in my life. I get confused. I get frustrated. And get, uh, guess what happens? I have a phrase. I love marriage because marriage means you have somebody else to blame for all the problems that you have. <laughs> <laughs> and, and unfortunately that tends to happen when you have someone close to you and things don't go right guess who gets the brunt of your confusion the one close to you and so your confusion leads to confrontation before you know it your confrontation leads to conflict it happens in homes now has it ever happened in your church Oh, no, not God's people. <laughs> we would never turn our con confusion into conflict, not us. <laughs> yes, it happens even in church. It happens with families all the time. And these two felt like family, but they were confused. And their confusion led to them confronting each other. And their confrontation began to come into conflict because they, they were not just speaking, they were arguing with one another and lo and behold who comes in the middle of the, all of that do you see who, who arrives Jesus himself drew near oh don't you like that don't you like it that you might be going in the wrong direction don't you like it that you might be confused and confronting uh, unjustly someone that you love and care for and you you have wrong ideas and wrong thoughts but in the middle of that Jesus himself draws near to you don't you love it and and that's what happened Jesus draws near and he went with him this is what I love 
Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save them that are lost. Guess, guess who sought these two men? Jesus. Not only did Jesus sought him, but he caught them. He sought and caught the ones he loves. And I love that about my risen Lord Jesus. Because no matter where you are, he's going to seek you out. And he's going to find you. He will. He sought and he caught. And he does it over and over and over again. And he does it for you. And he does it for me. And so Jesus meets them in the middle of the road. And uh, he goes on to say in verse 16, their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. And I, I, I'll just, I won't tell you all the theories, I'm just going to tell you what I think. I think that his body was perhaps a little different, but I don't think that was the reason. Uh, I mean, he had a glorified body, but, but I think their eyes were constrained from seeing him because they needed to see Jesus in the living word. They needed to see Jesus break open Scripture to them and, and see the promises of the suffering servant becoming glorified and sitting at the right hand of God. And so they were constrained from seeing and physically seeing who Jesus was. Um, in verse 17, he's, the, the Scripture goes on to say, He said to them, What kind of conversation is this? that you have with one another as you walk and are sad. This is the first of three questions that Jesus offers this, these men. And Jesus addresses their confusion. He addresses uh, where they are and their heartache. Jesus is concerned about what they think and how they feel. I, I want you to understand that Jesus understands that you can have confused thoughts and your feelings can go wacko. And he cares. Jesus cares. Jesus cares what you think and how you feel. Even though your thoughts may be foolish and your heart may be hard, uh, uh, he cares for you. He meets you. He finds you. He walks with you. He begins to address with you how you think and how you feel. And Brian, that's what a good counselor does, doesn't it? A good counselor sits with you, walks with you. All right, what you, what you thinking about this? How you feeling? And that's what Jesus does here. They're confused. And she says, okay, what kind of conversation are you having? And why are you so sad? And then verse 18, then one of the, those named Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and, ha and have you not known the things which have happened there in these days? He's amazed that this stranger who comes along doesn't know what has happened. And uh, he almost speaks condescendingly to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but this shows the power and effect of Jesus and how desperate his enemies were of the cross who sought to crush and kill Jesus because what happened uh, on that Friday, that terrible Friday, the conspiracy against our Savior was overwhelming what had happened. And, 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 and it was known what had happened. How can you not know what, what had happened? I mean, weren't you there when the sky was darkened? And, and weren't you there when people exploded out of the graves and were walking? I mean, come on. Weren't you there when the, uh, when the veil was torn between the holy and the holy of holies? Didn't you understand what, what, what had happened? That there was this great conspiracy against uh, Jesus Christ because he, he was going against the traditional religious establishment? And they crushed and killed him? Where were you? And, and so they're amazed at this. And then uh, verse, verse 19, he says, and he said to them, what, what things? So that's the second question. What things have happened? And so they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. So they addressed that Jesus was from Nazareth. 
they say he was a prophet. He was a prophet of God, mighty in deed and word before God and all people. They, they realized that Jesus was a mighty man of God. They realized that he was a prophet from the Most High and they had experienced these great deeds that God had done through, through Jesus Christ among the, among the people. And then they go on in verse 20 and say, well, how and how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him and condemned him to death and crucified him. And, and they told the strangers how the injustice had, had come and that Jesus had been executed by a, a horde in unjust fashion. In verse 20, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. But, you see that word? But. But. We have some big buts in our life, don't we? And I say that kiddingly, but I say it seriously as well. Um, we have great disappointment in our life. We have plans. We have goals. We have things that were expected, but they didn't come about. I know of no human that has stood before an altar and said, well, I'll get married for five years and if it doesn't work out, I'll move on. No. The but comes the sadness and the heartache of not measuring up. The difficulty of your plans failing. Buts happen in our life. But we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. They were looking for the anointed king to deliver them from the yoke of oppression from, uh, from, the, Ro from the Romans and instead they got a crucified king. He was killed on a cross. They thought he would be sitting on a mighty throne but he was nailed to the cross. They thought he would be holding a scepter but there was only a nail that was in his hands. They thought that he would be wearing a beautiful robe, but yet his robe was, uh, was, was just given away. So they were so disappointed. He was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Do you, do you connect? Do you see the irony? This is the third day. What did Jesus say to his disciples? These were disciples, not one of the twelve. We don't know if they were uh, in the upper room or not, we, but they were disciples who had heard Jesus prophesy, hey, three days, I will raise up from the dead. I mean, several times Jesus told his disciples, you can expect me to die he, he didn't, I don't think he mentioned crucifixion, but he said, you can expect me to die and, and in three days rise from the dead. And so here they're talking about their disappointment and their sadness, but it's been three days since. Jesus is alive. Wait a minute. It's not just Jesus is alive. Jesus is in their midst. Do you catch that? In the midst of your butts. The risen Lord Jesus is walking with you. Do you see it? Your eyes may not be open to it yet, but he's still there. He's still with you. He's still risen. There are things that God does that we don't get. Our eyes aren't open to his power and his magnificence, but yet he is at work and it's done. It's finished. It's completed. And Jesus is alive and risen. But they don't quite get it. It's been three days. It's been three days. But 
I don't know. I think I lost her. So, he, they go on in verse 22 and say, Yes, and certain women of the company who had arrived at the tomb astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they, were all, they had also seen a vision of angels who had, had said he was alive. In verse 24, he goes on to say, And certain of these who were with us went to the tomb and found it as a woman had said, but they did not see him. See, they kind of get an understanding of what's going on, but they don't. They, they're just missing it. And look at what Jesus says to them in verse 25. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into glory? And so he, he addresses two things. Sometimes you and I can be foolish of thought. We can have stinking thinking. We can have the miracle right in front of us, but we miss it. We can have the burning bush right there and walk right past it. We miss the mystery. We pass over the promise. They walked right by the t empty tomb. You, you heard them. The tomb is empty. They walked right by it and they missed it. How often do you and I miss the mystery and pass over the promises that God has given us. But you know what I love? Jesus is right there with them. <laughs> and Jesus addresses uh, how foolish of thought and slow of heart they are. Their confusion is due to their foolish understanding of Scripture. And their misunderstanding had led to dis discouragement. And their discouragement had led to disbelief or unbelief. I mean, he says Christ had to suffer these things. You knew that Christ had to suffer these things before he entered into glory. <clears throat> Sometimes the fire and passion and energy that we have are doused by our bad thinking and our slow hearts. Jesus went straight to the problems. He said, do you not believe in all that the prophets have spoken? Sometimes when you have a trouble getting fired up and you have trouble with racing thoughts, it's a matter of belief. Believing in the promises of God that God said what he said and he'll do what he promised. And if you cling on and hold tight to what God said he would do, that brings such hope and encouragement in the midst of things. And so Jesus, in verse 26, he shows them the way. So not only will Jesus uh, meet us in the way, but he will show us the way. In verse 27, he says, at the beginning of Moses, and uh, at the beginning, at, and beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, this is a beautiful thing. Essentially, this is what he's saying. All the Bible is about Jesus. Everywhere you look, you'll see the scarlet thread from Genesis all the way through to Malachi into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you don't see Jesus, you're not looking close enough because Jesus is there. He just laid it all out for them how he, he was uh, the anointed uh, lamb of God that was there the Passover lamb he showed them that Jesus was meant to die he showed him that he was a suffering servant in Isaiah he showed him that he was the anointed king that David had prophesied about and uh, he showed him uh, in, in Psalm 22 and, and Isaiah 53 all the promises of God Someone said it this way. There are 333 specific promises of God in the Old Testament that were fulfilled by the life of Jesus. And this is how he described it. Uh, you know how big Texas is? Well, you take uh, Texas and you put 
uh, uh, quarters that are six, in six inches high in all of Texas, and then you drop one quarter that is different, and then you mix them all up, and then you take someone on a helicopter and you drop that person in the state of Texas and they find that one quarter that's the chances of all the promises that are in the Old Testament coming true it, it, God had revealed himself in the Old Testament we, we just have to see it and so he shared with them beginning in all the Bible beginning with uh, Genesis and Moses and shared with them how Christ had to suffer, die before he ascended into heaven. He expounded to them all the scriptures. Verse 28, And they drew near to the village where they were going, and he inclined, uh, he indicated that he, he, he would have gone farther, but verse 29 says, They constrained him. In other words, they grabbed a hold of him. They said, You're not going anywhere. Uh, they, 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 we want you near us. Uh, there's something going on in us. Hope is awakening. The excitement and the joy are rising up in our hearts. You ain't going anywhere. And they constrained him and said, please don't go any further. And they invited them to, to their home. They said, abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the night is far spent. And he went to stay with them. Isn't it beautiful? Jesus stayed with you. Even though you don't quite get it, he sticks with you. Even though you don't quite understand, he's not shaking his head and condemning you. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to catch you. Because he loves you. Jesus not only sought, not only taught, caught but he taught and he wants to catch you he doesn't come to condemn he doesn't even come to condone your behavior he, he comes to catch you and, and to bring you back to himself in verse 30 and it came to pass as he sat down at the table and he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened. Isn't it beautiful? Jesus changes our way. And, and I want you to notice how beautiful this picture is. It's a picture of Jesus sitting down in a family setting, doing something he's done 1,000 times before with these same men. He takes the bread. He breaks it. He gives thanks. Now, of course, you and I know another time, just days before, we took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. There's an element of recognition there that this is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who had come to sacrifice his body and broke his body for our sins, for the remission of our sins. And this same one who died on Calvary's cross for our sins is the same one who promised he'd be risen from the dead. And, and in this intimate family setting when they were sharing life together, friend to friend, family to family, brother to brother, Mother to son. In this moment, their eyes are open. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Jesus wants more than your obedience. He wants you to be attached to him. He wants a relationship with you. If there's anything you get out of this, when you get lost, Jesus wants to find you, to be with you. We were talking in Sunday school how God doesn't just love us. He likes to be with us. Jesus died on the cross to bring you and I back to God so we could have a relationship with God. God likes you. And he likes to be with you. 
And Jesus comes to meet you where you are so he can love on you. And so their eyes are opened at that moment. And this is so significant because not only did he open scriptures and he opened hearts, but Jesus is the written and the living word. And their eyes were opened and they knew him means this. Means that, number one, Jesus opened the word to them. Jesus opened scriptures to them. The written word to them. And that light is a light unto your path. The Bible is light to you. But the problem is sometimes you may see, but you cannot... I mean, you, you, there is light, but you cannot see because your eyes aren't working. You need not only light, but the capacity to see light. And so not only did Jesus open the word to them, but he opened their spiritual eyes. Isn't that beautiful? He opened their eyes. Not just the word, he opened their eyes. And they saw. And then... The Bible says he was gone. Because they saw what they needed to see. See, what's so important to you and to me is these disciples are like you and like me. We encounter a risen Savior when we're going the wrong way. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to turn. We don't know where to go. And he encounters us and we begin to feel conv convinced and we begin to feel convicted as we read the word. And, and they're just like us. They don't have the picture of Jesus in their head. They don't see the risen Lord Jesus yet. But he's there. Just like yeah, us. They're a picture of you and I. They had to come to Christ the exact same way that you and I do. We have to open the word and God opens our eyes and then we, we see it. We've been going the wrong direction the whole time. Jesus changes everything. He changes our way. And, and, and what happened immediately is uh, fascinating. Verse uh, Verse 31 says, Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished in their sight. Verse 32 says, and They said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he walked with us on the road, and while he opened Scripture to us? Did our hearts not burn? Their hearts were gladdened, not saddened. They had this personal interaction with the risen Lord Jesus. And they experienced the power of the written and the living word as he opened scriptures to him. They, they, they were once slow of heart and dull of mind. And Jesus brought the fire back into them. Having a personal and passionate relationship with the risen Lord Jesus is the path to get fired up. And if you aren't fired up, it's because you don't have a personal and passionate relationship with this risen Lord Jesus Christ. It comes through encountering him first through the written word, and then you come to know the living word. When, he, when you start opening up your Bible, he will start opening up your eyes. Faith, the Bible says, comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There's been a theme these last several weeks that I've stuck with is your relationship to God is directly seen by your relationship to your Bible. Do you have an open Bible? Do you have a Bible that's read every day? Do you have your relationship to God is directly related to your relationship with the Bible? And we see it even here in this passage as they experience the risen Lord Jesus. Now, one of the things we come out of this is only the resurrected Jesus can quicken our slow hearts. Only when we realize He is alive, He is risen, death has been conquered. Every problem we face, every difficulty, every challenge is overcome by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
You know what the answer to death is? Life. Life. You know the worst thing that life can do to us? Really, nothing. When you have eternal life, breathing your last breath is just walking from one room into another. You have eternal life. And so I encourage you to have a personal relationship with this resurrected Lord Jesus Christ this morning. I encourage you if you have a heart that's sad and slow, if you have thoughts that are confused, open up your Bible and open up your eyes to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't make some difference. He didn't make a lot of difference. Jesus makes all the difference in your life. And sometimes we go, our wrong, wrong, go the wrong way, we lose our way, but it's time for you to hear that Jesus right here, right now, is coming alongside of you. And he's speaking to you. And he's not giving up. And he wants to bring you back to himself. You're going the wrong direction. Let him change your way. Let him change your mind. Let him change your heart. Let him change your way.